welcome again. Okay, so I put up a slide uh, about an assignment, and these are the assignments that I will use to assess your performance. And there's some printed copies over here if you want them. And please hand it in by deadline. It's a very simple task, only a one-page essay. Okay, and use your imagination. Okay. Right, so today's lecture, I'm going to focus on uh, interstices in the crystal structures, body-centered cubic, face-centered cubic, and hexagonal closed-packed. And interstices are the holes between the atoms. I'll give you examples of that. And we can get almost everything about them by thinking about atoms as hard spheres. Okay. So we'll assume, first of all, a hard sphere model of atoms and look at the role of interstices in crystal structures. Now, if you look at uh, the rough size of atom, you know, th these are just data which depend on the method of measuring the diameter of an atom. Okay? But all of these are measured consistently. If you look at the sizes of atoms, then important elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen are much smaller than the large atoms such as uh, the titanium, magnesium, and iron. So they do not substitute for iron positions or for titanium positions or for magnesium positions. They tend to locate themselves in the spaces between the large atoms. So whenever you look at uh, the diameter of an atom, uh, you know it really does depend on how you define the diameter. So don't take the numbers seriously, but the relative sizes are important. In particular, you know, when we get to something like hydrogen, when hydrogen enters the lattice, it's actually partially ionized. So what would you consider its size to be? It's very difficult to define that. OK. Uh, carbon is, of course, very important in uh, steels. And this is roughly the size of a carbon atom compared with nickel, iron, and chromium. So it's much smaller than the metal atoms. Here is a silicon atom inside iron, okay? and it's roughly the same size as iron, and therefore it substitutes. But because it's not exactly the same size, it will still cause some hardening in the lattice, because anything that disrupts the periodicity of the lattice will cause uh, interference with the movement of dislocations. So even though it's sitting comfortably in the same lattice, it has a smaller size, and it will have other properties which are slightly different, and therefore you get hardening. On the other hand, carbon sits between the atoms, and it doesn't fit properly. You can see here, it's actually pushing things apart when you have carbon in solution inside iron. So that causes uh, a much larger distortion than is typical for substitutional alloying additions. And here is the consequence of adding carbon into iron. Uh, this is looking at the change in the yield strength as a function of the atomic fraction of carbon, uh, carbon, nitrogen, or molybdenum. And this is for ferrite, and this is for austenite. In austenite, you do not get a sharp yield point. So this is actually the proof strength. Yeah? Is everyone familiar with the proof stress? It's basically the stress when you have about 0.2% of plasticity. So look, this is a very, very large effect, carbon, nitrogen, in ferrite. Compare that with a substitutional solute. Very small effect because, uh, well, I haven't explained why as yet. Because look, if you look at the difference in the hardening potency of carbon in ferrite and austenite, austenite is not hardened very much at all. Here, you have a massive increase in strength with a small concentration. Similarly, nitrogen, and again, austenite is not as much by nitrogen as it is by carbon. And substitutional elements have a weak hardening effect. So we've got to explain these phenomena and others which I will go into. Any, anyone and has any ideas why carbon causes much more strengthening in ferrite than in austenite? 
I look, this is, this is an order of magnitude greater strengthening, right? Any ideas why? Okay, so let's, let's just make a note of that. Uh, we haven't got a board here, but make a mental note that uh, it is possible that carbon causes a much bigger misfit when it enters the ferrite lattice than in the austenite lattice. So we'll test that assumption later. Okay? Okay, so this is our body-centered cubic uh, lattice, and this is the lattice parameter of ferrite. Can you tell me which is the close back direction? Because in order to decide on the size of the interstices, we need to work out the size of an iron atom. And a closed direction is defined as a direction along which the atoms basically touch. So if you have a closed back direction and you can count four atoms in there, then you can work out the radius of the iron atom in terms of the lattice parameter. So in this lattice, which is the closed back direction? 111, the body diagonal. Uh, the, this is the closed back direction. You can't see it from that graph because this is not a proper model. It doesn't fill the atoms are not to scale. So if you make a, a space filling model of the body center structure, then you can see that the touching is along the body diagonals. Okay. Is everyone happy with that? So 111 is a closed packed direction in body center cubic. There is no closed packed plane in ferrite. Okay. The, the nearest you get to is the 110 plane, but there is no plane in which you have touching along three directions. But there is a close back direction which is one on one. So how many atom radii do I have in that direction one on one? A one on one, how many radius radii of ion atoms equals A one on one? Four, yeah, if you look, this is two, half uh, sorry, one radius and one radius here. So it's very easy to calculate the size of the ion atom in this structure. One on one alpha is the close back direction. So if I take the magnitude of the one on one vector, that's equal to four times the radius of the ion atom. So you can express the radius of the ion atom in terms of the lattice parameter very simply. Okay. Everyone happy with working out the magnitudes of the vectors? This is a cubic system, so it's straightforward. It's the square root of the sum of squares of the components multiplied by the lattice parameter. Yep. Of course, that may not work when you go to non-orthogonal lattices. That means when you don't have 90 degrees between the axes and you have to use other techniques. Okay, so the radius of the ion atom in the body-centered cubic structure is defined. Now, what is, uh, this is the octahedral interstice. Octahedral means you're surrounded by uh, eight faces. These are the triangular faces. There are four faces on top, the dashed lines, and four at the bottom. So you are in an octahedral uh, box. And this is an octahedral hole in the iron lattice. Um, you can see it over here. So if you look at these four atoms of iron here, then they're like these four atoms, and the carbon atom sits in the middle with an atom at the top and an atom at the bottom. Okay. So what do you think is the point group symmetry of that octahedral hole? So remember how we define point groups, okay? You first looked at the z-axis. What are the symmetry elements along the z-axis for that interstice? So we have to find the symmetry elements going through that point. There's a fourfold axis parallel to z, right? So that's going through the center here. If I rotate by 90 degrees, I recover everything, right? And a mirror plane normal to that fourfold axis. So how do I write that? Four over m. Any uh, now look for two other axes at perpendicular to z. 
what will it what's the rotation axis twofold that's very good uh, so you've got a fourfold axis and two twofold axes like this what does that mean about the symmetry of that octahedron you know obviously the three axes are not equivalent right so it's not what you call a regular octahedron what would you call that symmetry where you have a fourfold axis and two twofold axes at 90 degrees it's tetragonal isn't it tetragonal means two of the edges are identical and the third one is different right so the octahedral hole in ferrite actually has tetragonal symmetry and you will see that later on this is extremely important to all the mechanical properties of ferrite which contains carbon so can you see that that is not a regular octahedron because this distance here is the square root of uh, 2 times the lattice parameter it's a 1 1 0 type direction and this is also zero type direction whereas this is the edge of the unit cell it's a 1 0 0 direction right so now I want to calculate the size of the larger sphere which will fit in that space okay so I want to find out what is the larger sphere that I can fit in the space without moving the atoms apart so which is the shorter distance is it this one or this one yeah it's the vertical distance which is the shorter and that's equal to the lattice parameter of ferrite and that will be equal to the radius of an iron atom plus twice the radius of the hole plus the radius of an iron atom So, we will see when we calculate the hole that carbon does not actually fit inside this and it pushes the vertical atoms apart. When you put a carbon atom in this hole, it will push these two atoms apart. But these ones are quite far away. So, by putting a carbon atom, you are actually reducing the tetragonality because this is extending relative to these two yeah. does that make sense that when I put a carbon atom inside ferrite it actually reduces the tetragonality of that octahedral hole have you heard many many times that when you add carbon to martensite it causes tetragonality right here I would add is that when I put carbon in that octahedral hole it actually changes the symmetry towards cubic of that hole so we'll come back to that point later on by making these two atoms go apart by shoving in a carbon atom you actually reduce the tetragonality of that octahedral hole so here we have the um, radius of the iron atom which we derived earlier by looking at the body diagonal and this distance here is A alpha, which will be equal to twice the radius of an ion atom here and here, and twice the radius of an octahedral hole. So it becomes very simple to derive the radius of the largest sphere that would fit in here without causing distortion, just by rearranging this equation and substituting for the radius of the ion atom. And you find that uh, the largest radius is about 0 0.067 of the ferrite lattice parameter and if I substitute a number for the ferrite lattice parameter which is about 2.866 angstroms then you find that the hole is 19 picometers in size pico means 10 to the minus 12 and this is the radius of a carbon atom it's about 77 so you can, you can imagine that when we put a carbon atom in here, it causes a very large distortion. Okay. So the strain field will extend to a large distance. 
So, it is correct to say that carbon in ferrite causes a very large distortion. Okay? But it is also important to note, you will see later, that the distortion is not symmetrical. The distortion is mostly along the z-axis. Along the other two axes, there's plenty of space. Okay? So this is not a regular octahedron. Everyone happy with that? Okay, now let's look at an alternative uh, hole, which is tetrahedral. So tetrahedral means you have four faces surrounding an object. Okay? So supposing that I have a pair of atoms like this, okay? and another pair of atoms at 90 degrees to that, then in between is an octahedral hole. Okay? That's the way to recognize an octahedral hole. I've got a pair of atoms there and another pair of atoms like this. If I join up the atoms, then I'll get a tetrahedron. Okay? Can you visualize that? So, if you look over here, this is a tetrahedral hole, because look, I've got a pair of atoms and a pair of atoms. Uh, that pair of atoms and that pair of atoms forming the four faces. And this tetrahedral hole is actually located on this face here. So, here, here, here is another view. If I put another atom on top, that carbon atom will be enclosed by four atoms. Yep. Now, I need to work out the size of that tetrahedral hole because at the moment we don't know whether carbon is going to go into the octahedral or tetrahedral interstices. So, it's quite difficult geometrically to do this. I think in terms of vectors, it becomes very, very easy. So, all I need to do is find what this vector is here. Okay. Because that will be equal to the radius of the ion atom plus the radius of the tetrahedral interstice. Yep. Now, just looking at that diagram, it's still difficult to see what that vector is. So, we'll draw a structure projection, which makes it a lot easier. So, this is a structure projection where I've got four unit cells of body-centered cubic structure. Okay? You can see there's one unit cell, second, third, and fourth, and these are the ones located at the body center. And this is where the tetrahedral hole is. Can you see that? Because look, I've got a pair of atoms at a half, and another pair of atoms at zero. So that's exactly what I was explaining, that you've got a pair of atoms crossing each other in the middle is a tetrahedral hole at a height quarter. So can you tell me now what is the vector joining the atom, ion atom at zero and the octahedral hole at that position? Ah, I've got the answer already on the slide. Okay, so look, uh, if I go zero along x, half along y, and a quarter along z, then that defines the vector zero half quarter, right? And if I express that in terms of integers, it's a zero two one direction. So the magnitude of the vector a alpha zero half quarter equal to the radius of the ion atom plus the radius of the tetrahedral interstice. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so let's just. Uh, do that calculation. So this is our vector. So we take uh, a quarter of this, a alpha upon 4, 0, 2, 1. The magnitude of this is equal to the radius of the ion atom plus the radius of the tetrahedral hole. And if I now simply substitute for the radius of the ion atom, which we derived from the body diagonal, And you get the radius of the tetrahedral hole simply from this equation, and it comes out as 36 picometers. In other words, it's larger than the octahedral hole. The octahedral hole, you recall, was 19 picometers. This is 36 picometers. It's still smaller than carbon, but the hole is actually larger. Now, do you know, uh, from your knowledge, do you know 
whether carbon sits in octahedral or tetrahedral interstices in ferrite? Sorry? Tetrahedral, is it? Yeah? So actually, it's octahedral. Yeah? If you do experiments, then the carbon prefers to be in octahedral sites. So that's very strange because, look, the size of the octahedral hole is much smaller than the size of the tetrahedral hole. So there's something, something strange going on here. Experimentally, the carbon sits in oxides. There's no question about that. But from the size point of view, the tetrahedral hole is bigger. You see later, there are also many more tetrahedral holes than octahedral holes. Okay, here's a very simple question. If I plot stress versus strain, what is the strain energy per unit volume given by? This is a, just a straight line. Yeah, area under the curve, right? So the area under the curve is half the stress times the strain. And I can eliminate the stress by saying it's the elastic modulus times the strain. So the area under the curve is half times the modulus times the strain. Yeah. There you go. Half the strain squared times the modulus gives you the area under the curve, which is the strain energy per unit volume. So what we need to do now is to explain why carbon prefers octahedral interstices instead of tetrahedral interstices by working out the strain energy when you put a carbon atom into each of those holes. Now, of course, uh, there's a complication because we cannot assume isotropic modulus. Yeah, this is a crystalline material, and I've emphasized that crystals are anisotropic. So we need to think about which directions the strains are happening in, inside the ferrite crystal. Okay, so here is our octahedral hole, and we are causing a strain along the 100 direction, so the modulus that's relevant is along the 100 direction, and this is the difference between the size of the carbon atom and the size of the octahedral hole, and the square of that will be proportional to the strain. Yeah. So if I multiply these two terms, uh, then I get my strain energy. I've only put a proportionality sign here. We need to take account of Poisson's effects as well, but I'm going to ignore them. So we have a strain energy term for the octahedral hole. And we need not worry about distortions along 110 because those atoms are far apart. On the other hand, if we look at the tetrahedral hole here, I have to multiply this by 4. Okay? Because the strain is uniform along all four directions. So if you add all that up, it's bigger than the strain that's caused in the octahedral hole. So it's the fact that the octahedral hole is not regular. That means there's a lot more space in the horizontal plane than along the vertical axis. That is the reason why carbon sits in the octahedral interstices. So it causes a larger distortion, but it's along one direction as opposed to along all the 210 type directions of the tetrahedral hole. Now, recently, uh, calculations have also been done to show that the chemical bond, uh, the chemical solution energy for carbon in octahedral holes is actually smaller uh, than for the tetrahedral hole. So there are actually two terms, but it's much easier to just think in terms of the strain energy term. They both are in the same direction. That means they favor the octahedral interstices. Okay. So this is the reason why carbon sits in octahedral interstices. Is everyone happy with that? Now, if you look at the positions where we had the octahedral 
holes. Uh, these are the. Um, you, you, this is a unit cell of ferrite. And if you count the total number of octahedral and tetrahedral interstices, then you see there are three octahedral interstices per ion atom and six tetrahedral interstices per ion atom in one uh, unit cell. Okay? So there's quite a lot of spaces available and I want you to remember these numbers. So there are three octahedral interstices and six octa octahedral in uh, tetrahedral interstices per ion atom in ferrite. I want you to compare them with austenite, which has different numbers per ion atom. Okay. And that has consequences. Okay, so let's now think about the austenite. So this is uh, the lattice parameter of austenites. It's a cubic F crystal structure, um, which is the close back direction. Direction along which atoms touch, yeah? One, one, zero. So these are close back directions here. Okay. And the close back plane is the one, one, one plane. You have atoms touching along three different directions in that plane. So this is a one, one, zero vector. And within that vector, you have four radii of ion atoms. So the magnitude of A110 is equal to 4 times the radius of the ion atoms. So here, the magnitude of 110 is 4 times the radius of the ion atoms, so we can express the radius of the ion atom in terms of the lattice parameter of austenite. And the lattice parameter of austenite is about 3.56 angstroms. Okay, so there's our octahedral hole right in the middle of the face-centered cube. And you can see the atom sitting here between these four atoms. And there'll be one above and one below, forming the eight faces of the octahedron. What is the point group symmetry of that hole? identical in all along all axes so it's four upon m four upon m four upon m so this is a fourfold axis this is a fourfold axis this is a fourfold axis as well right and all the all all of these are equal to the lattice parameter so this is a regular octahedron so the point group symmetry is four m, 4 upon m, 4 upon m, and it's a regular octahedron. So it will co if you put a carbon atom in there which doesn't fit, it will cause an isotropic strain, completely different from what we had in ferrite. It will cause expansion along all three axes. Okay, okay so here is the radius of the ion atom in terms of the 110 direction here. And that's equal to two ion atom radii and two octahedral hole. You know, there, there's one radius of ion atom here, two radii of the octahedral hole, and one at radius of ion atom equal to A gamma. So you can work out the larger sphere that will fit into that. And it turns out to be quite large, 52 picometers compare again with the radius of the ion atom. So you were right that there is more space available in the austenite okay, for the carbon atom. But remember that is causing distortion along all three directions this time, okay, not just along one direction. So it's not clear to me that the fact that this is a larger hole should lead to less strengthening. There's something, something big missing, and I'll come to that later. So this distortion causes very little hardening in austenite. It's almost, well, it's actually behaving like a substitutional solute. 
because a substitutional solute, when you substitute silicon for iron, it simply causes isotropic expansion. So something which causes isotropic expansion should have less hardening effect than an anisotropic expansion. We need to understand why. Have you got any ideas? Don't worry if you haven't. I'll come to that later. So the octahedral hole in austenite is much bigger. And this is the tetrahedral hole in austenite. So can you tell me what this vector is? Because that vector is equal to the radius of the iron atom plus the radius of the carbon atom. What is this vector? Again, you can look at a structure projection here. This is located at a quarter height. What is this vector? Just look at the structure projection. It should be very, very easy. Sorry? Quarter, quarter, quarter. Yeah, because look, quarter this way along x, quarter along y, and a quarter along z. So it's a quarter, quarter, quarter. In other words, it's parallel to 1, 1, 1. Okay. So the magnitude of the vector A gamma quarter, quarter, quarter is equal to the radius of the ion atom plus the radius of the tetrahedral hole. There you go. Quarter, quarter, quarter is equal to the sum of those two. And we know what the radius of the ion atom is by looking at the close packed direction. So simple substitution will give you that the tetrahedral hole a size of 36 picometers. That's, that's uh, still significant, significantly small compared with that of the carbon atom. So because in austenite both of these are regular, that means the tetrahedron is a regular tetrahedron and the octahedron is a regular octahedron. They both have isotropic expansion, so the carbon will naturally sit in the larger holes, which are the octahedral holes. So it's completely logical that in austenite the carbon atoms should sit in the octahedral holes and the octahedrals cause isotropic expansion, therefore the material still remains cubic. Okay, so let's go back to our slide showing how the interstitial atom influences strength. So you can see this is one order of magnitude greater than the strengthening in austenite. And it cannot simply be explained by the fact that the octahedral hole in ferrite is smaller because you only get strain along one direction. You have to think about the interaction of the interstitial with a dislocation. When Cottrell and Belby originally derived the theory for the yield point, you know the theory for the yield point in iron? Why do we get a yield point? Yeah, so you have a dislocation which has a core, which means it has an open space and the strain field around it. And if a carbon atom goes to that position, it lowers energy. So then to pull the dislocation away, you have to provide that extra energy. Therefore, the stress required to pull the dislocation away is more than the stress required to propagate. So you get a peak and then it drops as plasticity proceeds. Okay? And what is the purpose of a dislocation? What does a dislocation do when it moves? Yeah, but give me specifically, you know, uh, supposing I apply a hydrostatic stress, uh, that will simply cause volume expansion, right? What does it, it causes a shear deformation, right? And can a shear deformation interact with a volume change? No. Have you got an example for me? 
technological uh, example where we use the fact that a hydrostatic stress cannot cause shear. Have you heard of uh, sintering and hot isostatic pressing? Okay. So you make a complicated shape out of powder and then you pressurize it from all directions to allow the particles to fuse together. Yep. That's called hot isostatic pressing. And the reason why you do that is because you're dealing with a very difficult material which cannot be cast. So you want it in its final shape. Now obviously if applying pressure causes shear, you would lose that shape, right? So that process exploits the fact that a hydrostatic pressure causes a shear, and similarly a shear stress cannot interact with a hydrostatic strain. So if you have a uniform expansion, that will interact very little with a dislocation because the dislocation is about shear. Most of its strain field is about shear. That's why substitutional hardening is very weak compared with what carbon does in ferrite. The tetragonal strain associated with carbon in ferrite has an extremely strong interaction with the dislocation, whereas the isotropic strain for carbon in austenite does not. Okay? So that is the real reason why carbon causes a huge amount of hardening in ferrite because its strain is anisotropic. Isotropic strains have very weak interactions with dislocations. Everyone happy with that? So it isn't just about misfit, it's about the nature of the strain. It's a tetragonal strain as opposed to an isotropic strain. Substitutional elements only cause isotropic strain because they are simply substituting for an existing atom. Okay, just to summarize, uh, for ferrite we have uh, a very small octahedral interstice but the strain is confined mostly to one direction. The tetrahedral hole is larger and there are more tetrahedral holes than octahedral holes, but the strain energy and the chemical solution energy is greater for the tetrahedral hole than the octahedral hole. So these are the holes which are occupied. Okay. And in the case of austenite forward, these are both cause isotropic strains and therefore uh, the larger one will be the one that is mostly occupied when you put carbon in austenite the strengthening effect will be weak. And, you know, it's amazing that just by looking at the structure of the interstices, you can work out where the carbon atoms will locate, you know, by doing a simple calculation of strain energy, where they will locate, and also where they will have the greatest effect just by looking at the crystal structures. And when Cottrell and Wilby originally derived the yield point theory, uh, in order to make the analysis simple, they assumed that the carbon atom is just causing a volume change. Okay. And they captured, you know, 95% of the theory that it's the locking of the dislocations by carbon atoms which causes the yield point. And then later on, people modified the theory to include the proper strain so that you can make a quantitative comparison with yield point effects. Okay, so carbon is smaller, uh, carbon in ferrite stays in the smaller anisotropic holes, octahedral holes, and the resulting strain is anisotropic, and therefore there is a strong interaction between deviatoric means shear between the deviatoric and dilatational means volume change, dilatational strain fields of dislocations. Dislocations are about shear, and if you just have isotro isotropic expansion, then you would predict that uh, screw dislocations have no interaction with carbon atoms. Whereas that is not true. They interact as strongly 
carbon atoms in ferrite as edge dislocations because that screw dislocations have no volume change. I'm, I'm making statements which are approximate because remember crystals are anisotropic so it's a bit more complicated than saying screw dislocations have no volume change. Okay. So we get intense strengthening and there are three octahedral and six tetrahedral holes per atom of iron in ferrite. In austenite, the carbon sits in the larger isotropic octahedral interstices and it basically behaves like a substitution solute with weak interactions with locations. So you only get mild strengthening and the number of octahedral interstices is one third of what you have in ferrite. So one octahedral and two tetrahedral holes per iron atom. Okay. So that has consequences. You know, the difference in the number of atoms between the austenite, uh, number of holes per iron atom in the austenite and in the ferrite. So let's just focus on the octahedral holes. Uh, if you transform austenite into ferrite, then the number of octahedral holes increases by a factor of three. If you transform uh, the parent phase into the product phase, then you start with one octahedral hole per ion atom and you end up with three. So imagine that we have a mechanism of transformation which is diffusionless. Okay? And I want to show you how that happens. So this is my unit cell of austenite, it's face centered cubic. And in this diagram I've drawn two unit cells of austenite neck. I don't know why we've got these black images coming out, but I think it's still we can still see the essence of the diagram. So I've simply drawn two austenite cells next to each other. And I explained to you in the first lecture that a unit cell is not unique. There is an infinite choice you can make. So the red cell over here is still austenite. Okay. There's nothing different about it, but it's a body-centered tetragonal cell of austenite. Okay. All I've done is I've drawn this in red, but it's still the cubic F lattice. Can you see that? So this is the body-centered tetragonal cell of austenite. By looking at that, it's very easy to think how you can change that to body-centered cubic. You compress along the vertical axis and uniformly expand al along the horizontal axis, uh, and you end up with a cube, which is body-centered cubic. So that is known as the Bane strain, the Bane deformation that when you get diffusionless transformation, you can change the structure of austenite to ferrite simply by compressing along one axis and expanding along the other two axes. Is yeah. everyone happy with that? Now, if you look at the octahedral interstices, say they are located on each of these edges of austenite, then the fact that we have a Bain deformation means that the number of octahedral interstices will increase by a factor of three. So one sublattice of octahedral interstices changes into three in the martensite of ferrite. So if I had carbon atoms located in, in these three sites, as soon as I get the Bain strain, they will all be confined one set of octahedral interstices. The other two sets which are created will be empty. That means the carbon atoms will be located on parallel edges of the martensite, not on the other two sets. That is what makes it tetragonal. The carbon atoms are ordered on one set of octahedral interstices. So if you have diffusionless transformation, you necessarily end up with a tetragonal martensite if you have carbon. If the temperature is high enough, then the carbon atoms might redistribute also to the other octahedral interstices in the ferrite, and that might give you cubic martensite. But when it first forms, all the carbon atoms will be located along one set of edges in the martensite. The other two sets of octahedral interstices will be empty. So by definition, if you have a diffusionless transformation in austenite containing carbon, first you will get tetragonal martensite temperature might change things later on, 
the initial condition will be tetragonal. So this is why the apparent contradiction that I mentioned to you earlier, that when you put a carbon atom in an octahedral interstice in ferrite, it reduces the tetragonality of that whole, okay? Because it causes expansion along the z-axis. But if I have carbon atoms ordered on one set of edges, then that adds up to give you a tetragonal lattice. Now, this is an uh, incredible plot of the diffusion coefficient of ferrite over, over something like 16 orders of magnitude, diffusion coefficient of carbon in ferrite versus 1 upon the temperature. And diffusion theory, you expect that if I take the logarithm of the diffusion coefficient and plot it against 1 upon t, then I should get a straight line. And remember, this is 16 orders of magnitude here. And sure enough, you get a straight line uh, at low temperatures, but at high temperatures, it's no longer a straight line. So there is a, a larger diffusion coefficient than you expect. And the reason for this is that at high temperatures, even the tetrahedral interstices start to become occupied. Uh, you know, temperatures favor entropy, right? high temperature favors disorder. So confining things to just the octahedral interstices is a lower entropy, but if you raise the temperature, then it will tend to disorder the carbon atoms, and some will be occupied, uh, some tetrahedral interstices will also be occupied. And that's why you get the deviation in the diffusion coefficient, because actually, when you think about the movement of carbon atoms in ferrite, you have to think about three diffusion coefficients. The first one is when the carbon atom jumps from octahedral to tetrahedral to octahedral site because separating two octahedral sites is a tetrahedral site. Okay. So it cannot jump directly from octahedral to octahedral. And then you have the jump between tetrahedral sites. Remember, there are six per ion atom, so it is possible to jump from tetrahedral to tetrahedral. And then you have the jump from tetrahedral to octahedral to tetrahedral. And we have information on all of these including the activation energies and so forth. This is the fraction of sites occupied, whether it's octahedral, or in this case it's octahedral, and one minus that is how many atoms are in the tetrahedral. So, so you can pick up the fact that some of the carbon atoms are no longer in octahedral site from that diffusion coefficient which is measured at high temperatures. Okay, so what I've shown you is very elementary considerations of the crystallography of the material that you're looking at. You can derive such important consequences, for example, why the strengthening of ferrite is uh, a lot greater than of austenite when we put interstitial species. And this applies to whether it's you know iron or titanium or whatever. Yeah. If you look at the misfit and the symmetry of the misfit, caused by the interstitial atoms, you can derive a lot more information. And the consequences are not simply on strength, but on many properties. I've shown you also diffusion coefficients, but even the cap capability to absorb vibrations depends on the nature of those interstices. So if I take a wire and I make it into a pendulum, so there's a weight doing that, at certain frequencies, uh, there will be a lot of damping. And that's because the carbon atoms start jumping between adjacent sites under the influence of stress. Because when you apply stress, you will cause the lattice to expand along one direction, so the carbon atom wants to sit in that more spacey hole. Right? Do you know what this effect is called? We have equipment in GIFT to measure this. damping, yeah, the snook effect. Have you heard about that? So snook uh, designed a pendulum, and then as a function of temperature, you look at the frequency, and you can show that the carbon atoms are jumping between adjacent sites as, as it vibrates. Okay. When you deform politic wire to produce you know, wire for bridges and so on, you take 
perlite, uh, which is ferrite and cementite, put a huge amount of strain into it to make the wire, you know, three gigapascals in strength. Now, one consequence of that is that cementite goes into solution. Yeah, because you break up the cementite particles, and some of them dissolve and enter solution in the ferrite. So the ferrite in the wire is actually supersaturated with carbon. Okay. But the strain fields that you put in actually increase the solubility of the carbon in the ferrite because it makes it slightly tetragonal. Okay. So there are many, many consequences coming from simple crystallographic theory. So I'll stop there. Uh, some of you who came late, please pick up this assignment, which you li I would like uh, handed in uh, on Monday when we have the lecture, okay? So thank you very much.